week on Jerusalem Dateline. Step inside the place believed to be where Christ was buried and rose again. We'll take you on a tour of the garden tomb. And the movie Ben-Hur is a Hollywood classic. For some Christians, it's become an Easter favorite. We'll look at the life of the man who made it. Plus, making unleavened Passover bread, matzah, and its spiritual significance for both Jews and Christians. Hello and welcome to this Easter and Passover edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Julie Stahl, filling in for Chris Mitchell. Thousands of Christians visited the Holy Land this week to celebrate Easter. In Jerusalem, two sites claim to be the place where Jesus was buried and rose again. But which one's authentic? Chris Mitchell takes us in search of an answer. Located near the heart of Jerusalem is a place called the Garden Tomb what some believe was the Garden of Joseph of Arimathea. Here, some believe Jesus died, was buried, and then rose from the dead. The Garden is a two-acre oasis in the often hectic city of Jerusalem. British Christians bought the Garden 125 years ago and formed the Garden Tomb Association. For years, they've allowed visitors here free of charge. Richard Murian is the director of the Garden Tomb. What we do have here in the garden is a perfect representation of the biblical account at the end of the four Gospels. Everything in those four Gospels matches what we show people here in the garden. Today, nearly a quarter of a million visitors pour into the garden tomb each year. Guide Steve Bridge took CBN News on a tour visitors get when they come to the garden. What we plot out is the basic geography that we have in the Bible. Jesus was crucified outside of the city walls uh, at a place called Golgotha. And in the immediate area to where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden that belonged to a rich man uh, by the name of Joseph of Arimathea. We came first to the place the Bible calls Golgotha, where the book of Matthew says, and when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, place of a skull. What are some of the main questions that people ask you when they come here? I mean, some of the main questions, uh, certainly from Christian groups, would be around, you know, can we be certain that this mm -hmm. is yeah. the place where Jesus died and where he was raised to life? Um, people often ask about um, how come there are two places, there's here and there's the Holy Sepulchre. The question arises because some believe Jerusalem's Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the actual place of the crucifixion and resurrection, not the garden tomb. Constantine's mother, Queen Helena, helped build the church in 326 AD. The archeological weight supporting the church's claim is substantial. For example, the Roman Emperor Hadrian built a temple on the site in the second century because local Christians venerated the site as the place of Golgotha. But the evidence for the garden can be compelling too. The Gospel of John says, at the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. If you have a garden, you need lots of water, especially in the dry Middle East. The garden tomb contains one of the oldest and largest cisterns in Jerusalem. It's 2,000 years old and holds about 200,000 gallons of water. So the tomb that we have here is um typical of a first century Jewish Rolling Stone tomb. Uh -huh. It's dated as being at least 2,000 years old, mm -hmm. possibly older. In the garden, the Bible also says there was a tomb. It is carved out of the solid rock. It's a man-made tomb, and that's how the Bible describes the tomb in which Jesus' body was laid. This channel that you can see in front of the tomb entrance is where the stone would have sat that would have been rolled across to seal the entrance yeah. to the tomb. Mm -hmm. So finally, the, the most important thing about this tomb itself is that it's empty. So why don't we go inside and have a look? Okay. What we're looking at when we look in this direction is through into the burial chamber itself. And uh, what you have inside the burial chamber are these two um, areas where a body would be laying. One just down here and one on this side. The tomb itself seems to fit the Bible's description. But whether the Garden Tomb or the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is the site of the resurrection of Jesus, many Christian pilgrims take with them a profound affirmation of their faith. I'm a Bible teacher in the States and I have so many pictures and things to go back and to show them and want to just take some of this passion back that Jesus is who he says he is and he is the Son of God and he did walk this earth. 
As people look forward to Easter, those at the Garden Tomb stress, it's not the place, it's the person. The Bible writers really weren't that interested in establishing where Jesus died. The Bible writers themselves were much more interested in Jesus Christ himself, who he is, why he died. And that's what we want people to take away, that the tomb is empty. And we as Christians of all the world faiths serve a living God who has overcome death, who has dealt with the sin in our life, and Jesus is the centrality of our Christian faith, is he not? And so here in the garden, that's what we want people to take away, is the living Lord Jesus. The Easter weekend is the weekend that changed the world. And the weekend when Jesus died and was buried and rose again for me and for you. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. These are busy days in Jerusalem. Inside the old city walls behind me, discoveries have caught the attention of Jewish and Christian scholars. More than 2,000 years of history are recorded on the walls of one building where Pontius Pilate may have judged Jesus. John Wagi explains. At the western edge of the old city, the Tower of David stands above the walls. 16 years ago, archaeologists found a building while working on the Tower of David Museum. Records on its walls go back even before the time of Jesus and the Roman governor who sentenced him to the cross, Pontius Pilate. For years, experts suggested that Pilate handed down his death sentence from Antonius Fortress on the other side of the city where the Roman soldiers were housed. But recent evidence uncovered here at the site of King Herod's palace indicates that the luxury-loving Pilate was more likely to have pronounced judgment here. Archaeologist Amit Re'em helped discover the palace site in 1999. He's familiar with the history on these walls from Herod's time until the British put a prison on it in the 1940s. Until now, those impressive walls are the only remains from Herod's palace. We do not know what happened to the superstructures, to the palace itself. Maybe it was destroyed in the big revolt. Maybe it was destroyed by the Romans. Maybe it was destroyed by, by the Crusaders or the Ottoman. We don't know exactly where Jesus uh, was tried, where he had his uh, interview before Pontius Pilate. Uh, but we know it's somewhere in Herod's palace. David Pelegi is pastor of Christ Church, just steps away from the site. We know that the palace of Herod the Great eventually became Roman property after Herod's death and that every year Pontius Pilate would come from Caesarea to Jerusalem here during the time of Passover to oversee the security of the city during the festival that the Jews called the Feast of Freedom. And it was at this time where if there was going to be trouble in Jerusalem, it would be uh, during the Pas Passover holiday. Pelegi says that in a way, the Tower of David encompasses the entire life story of Jesus. Scholars have been saying for, for half a century that uh, the life of Jesus begins at the Tower of David or what was then Herod's palace. That's when the Magi come to visit King Herod. And his life ends basically when Pontius Pilate sentences him to death pretty much in the same location. So there's some very interesting irony in this story. Israeli archaeologist Renee Sivan is still struck by its power and opulence, even though she helped begin the digging. Jerusalem is like an onion. You peel it, peel it, peel it, and it never ends. But then you, you cry a bit, but not, not too much. That is what happens here. Pelegi calls the Tower of David the best museum in the city and says tourists would do well to start their journey here. Now we have the extra bonus of uh, having the, the very place where Jesus was sent to execution by Pontius Pilate, and this will help Christians better visualize those uh, monumentous events that happened to uh, Jesus the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth, in the last week of his life. And just a couple of miles away, the Mount of Olives, where scripture says he'll come again. John Wagi, CBN News, Jerusalem. Coming up, a look at what goes into making the unleavened Passover bread matzah. One of the key elements in the Passover Seder is unleavened bread known as matzah. 
our Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell takes a look at how they make that biblical food and explains its symbolism. The Bible calls it the bread of affliction, unleavened bread or matzah. Every year the Jewish people are commanded to retell the story of their exodus from Egypt and to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Because the Lord made them live very fast, they had to make uh, bread that didn't have time to rise and uh, they, they ate this, this flat bread, which is matzah. Most Israelis take the commandment to eat unleavened bread very seriously, and many actually like it. Grocery stores like this one devote whole sections to it. And besides regular matzah, you can get egg, whole wheat, and even choco matzah. The regular matzah must be made of flour and water only. The flour would look to you and at like a regular flour, but it's not regular flour. Roy Wolf is vice president of Matzot Aviv. He told CBN News the whole process, from mixing to rolling to shaping to baking, must be finished in 18 minutes because the moment water touches the flour, it starts rising. In reality, our process is much, much faster. We want to be as efficient as possible, and the whole process takes no longer than three, four minutes. But every 15 minutes, in order to avoid uh, to have any leftovers of uh, leavened dough, we have to clean the mixer system. Wolf is the sixth generation to work in his family's business, which started in 1887. They've been in the current factory since 1946. In the basements here where we have the flower silos today, the Haganah, the first defense forces, used to hide the weapons from the British uh, mandate. Since 1946, we've been here making matzah. Uh, of course, the, the, the factory was refurbished several times. At Matzot Aviv, they make about 20 tons of matzah per day. They start in October and work around the clock for the last month, except on the Sabbath, to provide matzah to Jewish communities in Israel and around the world. We are exporting uh, to over 35 countries, to all Jewish communities uh, around, the, uh, around the world, from the large communities in North America to even the smallest community. There's one person that's in Wallis Island. He's the doctor of the island, and we are sending him matzah every year. And so he will, have, he will be able to have a, a seder with, with matzah from Israel. But we also have Christian communities buying matzah in countries like Korea and Singapore, where it's, uh, I, I, the, uh, I've been told that in some churches it's been used as the, the holy bread. The Last Supper would have been a Passover seder with unleavened bread. Because of that, many Christians like to take communion with matzah. Some even say that the design of the matzah, striped and pierced, is symbolic of the Messiah himself. You might think with all this matzah making that the Wolf family would get tired of Passover, but not so. We're waiting for the Seder. We usually come very tired to the Seder because I'm working until the, the same day in the afternoon. But it means a lot. This holiday, of course, means a lot to us. One Israeli compared matzah to a data drive, passing along information from generation to generation. Chris Mitchell, CBN News. Up next, the spiritual journey behind the creation of a classic Hollywood movie, a look at the life and faith of the man who wrote Ben-Hur. For many people, watching the movie Ben-Hur has become an Easter tradition. But there's an amazing story behind the film. As Wendy Griffith shows us, everything about Ben-Hur is larger than life. The 1959 blockbuster Ben-Hur made history with a record 11 Academy Awards. And the 1925 version is making a comeback. What many may not know, however, is that Hollywood didn't create this classic story. The idea came from the best-selling novel, Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, published in 1880. The book tells the story of a life-altering encounter between a first-century Jewish prince and Jesus of Nazareth. The author behind Ben-Hur is Lou Wallace, a true Renaissance man. He tried different things. He loved to paint, he loved to write, he loved to do creative things. He loved the military. He became a prosecuting attorney. He was in the legislature for a term. Wallace showed a talent for writing early in life. He learned about the Bible while at boarding school. While he didn't care for church, the story of the three wise men fascinated him. Little did I dream then what those few verses were to bring me, that out of them, Ben-Hur was one day to be evoked. Wallace's writing took a back seat to other priorities, 
He fought in the Mexican-American War and the Civil War, becoming the youngest Major General in the Union Army. He also married and had a son. Throughout the years, he kept coming back to the biblical account of the three wise men. So he decided to write a magazine article about them. I had no convictions about God or Christ. I neither believed nor disbelieved in them. Yet when the work was fairly begun, I found myself writing reverentially with awe. Still, Wallace had much to learn about God, as he found out in a chance encounter with a well-known atheist named Robert Ingersoll. Well, Robert Ingersoll knew far more about the Bible. Mm. Hey, you don't preach against something unless you know it. Right. And so he just kind of filleted Lou. The time had come for Wallace to form his own opinion on the subject of religion. My ignorance of it was painfully a spot of deeper darkness in the darkness. I was ashamed of myself. And he realized at that point, I have no business submitting this finished story for publication. I don't know what I was talking about. I need to do the research. I need to learn the Bible. I need to learn the story. Early in his research, Wallace created the fictional character of Judah Ben-Hur, telling how he witnessed the real-life events leading up to the death and resurrection of Christ. Wallace soon began to see God through the eyes of his character. Long before I was through with my book, I became a believer in God and Christ. This is the original manuscript of Ben-Hur, A Tale of the Christ, 650 pages, handwritten in purple ink. When Lou Wallace delivered this to Harper and Brothers back in 1880, they had no idea it was about to make publishing history. The book became the best-selling novel of the 19th century. It has never been out of print. What kind of impact did Ben-Hur have on a post-Civil War country? It just was the right book at the right time. People were looking for ways to reconcile to come together. They were exploring, you know, how can there be a God that would allow a war to happen like this? After its publication, letters flooded in, including one from President James Garfield. He wrote, with this beautiful and reverent book, you have lightened the burden of my daily life. Wallace's own burdens had always been lightened outdoors. He did most of his writing under what came to be known as the Wallace Beech Tree. Its spreading branches drooped to the ground, weighed down by their wealth of foliage, and under them I am shut in as by the walls of a towering green tent. That famous Wallace Beech Tree is no longer here. It actually died shortly after Wallace did and was replaced by this bronze statue of him behind me. But right over here is a building that Wallace dreamed about for decades, but never had the resources to build until the success of Ben-Hur. Lou built this as his private retreat. Wallace designed this 19th century man cave where he spent his golden years, writing every day until his death in 1905. His grave marker is inscribed with a quote from Ben-Hur by one of his beloved wise men. I would not give one hour of life as a soul for a thousand years of life as a man. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, Crawfordsville, Indiana. When we come back, the creative power of God flowing through one of his followers, an illustration of the passion of Christ done in sand, you won't want to miss it. Welcome back. When Joe Castillo was young, he discovered he had a gift for art. When he became a Christian, he began to use that gift to share Christ. Now he uses sand as a unique tool to tell his stories. Take a look at the crucifixion and resurrection story like you've never seen it before. The story, of course, starts out in the Garden of Gethsemane out on the hillside outside of Jerusalem. And it was there that Christ took his disciples to pray. And he knew what he was facing, although the disciples did not.
and hanging on the cross there is when he spoke the words, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The grave where he lay, they had rolled a, a large stone over the opening. And sometime in the night, the grave had been opened, and the man that everyone thought was dead had risen from the dead, and the tomb was empty. And Christ wanted to be there, not to be any doubt at all, and showed them the wounds in his hands so that they would believe that he had come back from the dead. Every year, thousands of Christians celebrate the resurrection at a sunrise service at the Garden Tomb in Jerusalem. It's the place where many believe Jesus' resurrection occurred nearly 2,000 years ago. Services will be held that morning in English, Scandinavian, Korean, and even one in both Hebrew and Arabic. CBN News in Jerusalem will live stream the first service. Join us for the exclusive live broadcast in English at 11.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time on Saturday. No guilt and lies, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. Thanks for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this special edition. And as we say in Jerusalem, Hag Sameach, Happy Holidays. We'll see you next week on Jerusalem Dateline. No power of hell.